I wanted to talk a little bit about what I sort of talk, refer to as the tokenization of everything. And, um, but I'm going to sort of set the stage a little bit by uh, talking about from Circle's perspective sort of how we think about, you know, first, what is the fundamental innovation that enables the tokenization of everything and how to kind of classify different layers of value in the crypto ecosystem. Um, and then I want to talk specifically about um, what this opportunity means for financial assets. And that's really the focus of Circle. We're a, a financial company, but building on top of uh, crypto infrastructure. Um, just first, a little bit about Circle, if you aren't familiar. Um, we have a number of different product initiatives. I'm not going to talk about these in, in much detail here. Uh, we have a, a free payment service, uh, Circle Pay, uh, that's behind the scenes, built on crypto and blockchain tech. Uh, we have a, uh, a retail-focused app that is, is just coming out called Circle Invest, lets you very easily invest in a, a wide variety uh, or an initial variety of crypto assets and expanding that uh, quite a bit. Um, and we just acquired a, a crypto exchange, um, which we, we think of as ultimately a token marketplace, and I'll come back to that as we talk about the tokenization of everything. Um, we sort of internally call that Circle X. And then Circle Trade, which um, it's not a retail thing, but basically we are one of the largest traders of crypto assets in the world. We trade $4 billion a month in crypto with a wide range of institutions. So institutions that are doing a lot with crypto investing and trading um, would work with that service. And then we have a new nonprofit foundation um, which is spinning out of Circle called Center. And that's an open source project uh, and, a, and a payment scheme um, for using what we refer to as um, fiat-backed stablecoins uh, over public blockchain. So basically replacing things like the Visa network, but using real fiat money uh, and stablecoin architectures. And that's something that um, is in development and, and we'll release more of later this year. Um, just sort of coming way up a level um, from some of the, the deeper dives technically that we've had uh, today and yesterday, um, just at a high level, how we at least think about kind of the crypto basics. Um, you know, first, what is this revolution that we're dealing with? At the highest level, we think of it as um, a few things. The, the first is uh, an open, immutable, incorruptible record-keeping system. That's a, a layer that we're seeing built, uh, which is super valuable. The second is uh, ideally also an open, immutable transaction processing system. So you can process transactions about those records in a very open way, in a very incorruptible and immutable way. And then lastly, and related, is um, uh, ideally also an open, immutable, secure computation system. So you can write code in an open way, in a transparent way, that can be deployed in, in, in an unmodifiable fashion and in a very auditable fashion. So secure computation, secure pr transaction processing, and, and then this immutable record keeping system. And, those, to, to us at least, those are the, the kind of fundamental breakthroughs. Um, there are many others, but these are the fundamental breakthroughs that we get really excited about. And from our perspective, this is just like a new fundamental infrastructure layer of the internet. It's a new layer that's been missing from the internet um, for the last 20 years, and it's now being sort of laid down uh, uh, right as we speak. So in addition to the sort of technical innovation, what makes these really interesting and makes all of this really interesting is that this is sort of a combination of um, both technology and sort of economic incentives. So economic incentives plus protocols plus network schemes that essentially allow us to operate these global public utilities uh, and global platforms without any central corporation, without any government running them. Uh, and, and as this crosses into the realm of value and, and value exchange and, um, and sort of fundamental record keeping of society, that's pretty powerful. We haven't had global public utilities that everyone can build on and rely on for these types of tasks. Uh, and so that's what makes, I, I think, this very exciting. Um, when we sort of drill more deeply into it, uh, w what I'm excited about is that this allows us to, for the first time really ever, um, at least in the modern age, really rethink uh, what our microeconomic units are. So we really rethink what is a corporation uh, what defines it? What is the nature of that entity? How does that exist in the world? How does that interact with value, with labor, uh, and the output of that value? 
and really reconceptualize that in this very global uh, digital environment. So that's um, what we're excited about. Um, in, in a more mundane way, um, we think about the industries that this impacts. And uh, a, lot of, you know, a lot of folks uh, focus in on payments or they focus in on um, narrower use cases, secure private uh, value exchange and, and so forth. Um, we're interested in how this applies across a lot of different industries. And uh, at a high level, uh, I think about fiduciary and record keeping industries as including a lot of different things. So that includes essentially every dimension of finance. Uh, and finance to us is not just like bank accounts and payments. It's a really, really deep and, and broad uh, domain of uh, businesses and, and use cases. The entire accounting profession, how we count things, keep track of things, audit things, verify things, make sure people are trustworthy, trustworthy make sure businesses are trustworthy. So the entire practice of accounting can be reinvented on this. Um, the insurance industry, which is like really not like the most exciting industry in the world, but, but essentially it's this vast multi-trillion dollar industry of people placing bets on outcomes in society. Um, we have an opportunity to, to, to reinvent how that industry works. The very basics of corporate and commercial law, how we actually apply rules to and adjudicate um, value exchange and records and, and the like. Um, Basically, every system of voting and governance, um, that's, that includes governments, obviously, and voting in governments. Um, but also, I think more, more uh, directly, governance of corporations. Um, right now, voting and equity are really tied together. And, and when we think about how decisions are ultimately made inside of businesses, the, the very fundamental value-based decisions are made with governance, which are basically just a bunch of people sitting around uh, and law firms intermediating, um, and there's, again, an opportunity to pretty dramatically improve that. And then ultimately, kind of every uh, kind of record-keeping slash certification-oriented public and civil service, everything from the DMV to your house title to land ownership to uh, all the different types of record-keeping that exist that run society um, also can, can be reinvented. So, when you kind of add these up, it, it ends up looking like a really, really broad layer. And, and these are um, all industries which you know, basically haven't been changed that much by the internet to date. You can argue at the surface that they have uh, through access, uh, through web browsers and apps and so on. But at the core, those industries really haven't changed that much. And so I think what's at stake here is the ability to revisit and rebuild all of these in a completely new way. Um, before getting into sort of uh, how we think about tokenization of everything, um, I want to break down how at least we think about the sort of different categories of crypto assets. Um, and we think of crypto assets as, as uh, you know, purely digital assets that are issued and mediated, um, either issued as or by uh, uh, public blockchains. Uh, they have free floating value, market price free floating value, and are liquid typically on a growing number of digital asset exchanges. So there, there can be crypto assets, perhaps, that live outside of this definition. But this is the definition that I'm looking at, which are the sort of publicly uh, available uh, crypto assets. And we kind of break that into a few categories, cryptocurrencies, crypto commodities, and crypto securities. And um, we have to look at these through these lenses because of legal and regulatory issues, because actual governments are actually classifying these and saying, if you want to handle these, uh, this type or that type or another type, you actually have different laws that apply to you as a business, um, despite at the end of the day all of this just basically being open source software that people are applying. Um, so cryptocurrencies obviously include things like Bitcoin as well as uh, a lot of other uh, uh, currencies. So we have a lot of uh, uh, privacy focused, and I would include even Bitcoin in that from its original design goal as an anonymous digital cash. Um, what I would refer to as settlement tokens, so uh, cryptocurrencies that were at least initially conceptualized as tokens that are part of settlement schemes for fiat currency transactions like Ripple and Stellar, uh, although these are evolving in, in their design center. Um, and then the sort of stable coins is also, in our mind, a cryptocurrency. So stable coins being uh, various types of coins that are meant to act as stable 
uh, uh, stable mediums of exchange. And so there are a lot of different approaches to stable coins. I'm going to touch on that in a few minutes as well. Um, we think it's pretty fundamental. But ultimately, fiat-backed stable coins will be a really popular form of cryptocurrency in the world. And we're right on the cusp of, I think, seeing that on a larger scale. Um, crypto commodities, um, we think of as a, a crypto asset that is used as a token of some sort to consume or utilize some other infrastructure resource or application. Uh, so Ethereum is probably the best known example of that. Ether is, a, is a, uh, an asset that is a commodity asset that is used to consume computation resources that it provides on its network. Uh, there are other projects that are similar uh, or have different, certainly, design goals in some cases, but fundamentally are uh, commodities that are meant to be used to consume a infrastructure service, oftentimes, uh, or higher level uh, applications as well. Um, you know, these are really ambitious projects. Um, I think they represent um, a kind of new OS uh, layer for the internet, a new OS layer for the global economy. So I'm, I think these crypto commodities and the associated computing platforms are, are, uh, are, are pretty fundamental. Um, and, and obviously relate to this last category of crypto securities. So, um, you know, crypto securities are, and these are just my definitions, um, new forms of tokenized securities. And what I mean by that is they're rules-based financial contracts uh, that, uh, that are using these underlying crypto computing systems um, as the record keeping engines, as the transaction and settlement layers uh, for the securities for these contracts themselves. Um, but they have a lot of new capabilities that go way, way beyond uh, what we traditionally think of as a security, like an equity or a bond, uh, which are the classic types of securities that um, we think of in the financial world. They go well beyond in terms of what they can offer, how they can be used, and the power that they can put in the hands of ultimately the users that would use these types of securities. Um, but, but today, you know, when we think of securities, we think of law firms, and we think of you know, paper-based stuff like my stock certificate and, and what rights I might have as a shareholder in a business. Um, we don't really think about something as powerful as crypto securities. Um, these obviously often and almost always merge some form of utility value with financial value. So all this sort of builds to this idea of the tokenization of everything. And, um, you know, in our mind, uh, we're at the beginning stages of uh, this sort of process and where essentially every asset, um, every uh, form of financial value, but every asset can be stored uh, and as a, uh, a crypto token um, and can have associated rules and contracts associated with it. So that, in, in our mind, means that essentially every fiat currency um, your dollars, your RMBs, your, your peso, et cetera, uh, all forms of equities, every form of stock that we know of in the world today, every form of, of debt relationship, a bonded debt relationship, every form of loan, uh, every insurance contract, um, all of these things we think will be tokenized, uh, will become crypto assets that are uh, stored uh, and computed and verified and exchanged on these infrastructures, uh, and ultimately the securitization of every form of property. So there's really no reason why your house or your car or your land or your personal property can't be tokenized. Uh, there isn't any reason why a landowner in India couldn't securitize part of their land and sell a portion of that in a contract directly to consumers with digital wallets using fiat stable coins that are investing in that contract without any intermediary generating dividends and yield for that landowner and, and, and obviously creating an investment opportunity for consumers and to do that with billions of people all around the world uh, directly. So that's like we're right on the cusp of those kinds of things being possible. Obviously there's some things in the way uh, in our mind. Um, some of the big ones uh, include uh, much more mature and scalable public blockchains. So it's really exciting to think about these possibilities, but if we tried to do any of them today, it would be extremely difficult. So we need to have radically higher levels of, of scalability um, and, and maturity in the infrastructure. And I think there's obviously a lot of great work going on towards that end. And I look at this similar to um, 
you know, the, the, the early days of the internet and um, even the early days pre-broadband when, you know, people could imagine like streaming HD television over the internet, but there are obviously a lot of steps between here and there to get there. And I think um, similarly, we're gonna have to execute a lot of, of things, not just at the technical level, but even at the policy level to make this possible. A second piece, and I'm gonna touch on this a little bit more, is what I call um, fiat-backed stable coins. I think these are deeply fundamental to making this happen and I'll talk about why in a sec. Um, what I would refer to as token marketplaces or mature token marketplaces, there need to be platforms that individuals and businesses can use to tokenize their things, to express the rules of those tokens, and to exchange them, and to have liquidity on the exchange of those, and to do that on a global scale with billions of people. Um, so m token marketplaces uh, are, in, in our minds, like fundamental market infrastructure that need to emerge. And what we think of as crypto to crypto exchanges today are like really, really early kind of like alpha versions of what these token marketplaces could become in the future. And then finally, um, you know, a lot of legal and regulatory clarity uh, on this vast and diverse range of crypto tokens that are emerging. Um, there's this enormous diversity of how you could classify these things. And whether we like it or not, governments are going to have a say in this, and we have to get clarity, and we want to get as much clarity as we can so that we all know the rules of the road on this stuff. Um, I said I would mention this a little bit more, so the importance of stable coins. I believe that to be adopted by mass society, by billions of people, um, these tokenized assets, these tokenized crypto securities and the like, have to be denominated in fiat money at least until we have globally accepted price-stable cryptocurrencies. And so it's, in my view, much more likely that we will have fiat-backed stable coins, like this year, next year, the year after, before the whole world decides, no, we're just gonna adopt uh, uh, price-stable cryptocurrencies that are not government-issued. So this is a matter of sequencing. Eventually, we very likely will have globally accepted price-stable cryptocurrencies uh, but that's not going to happen for a while, at least in a, in a mass society context. And so this is really, really critical. We have to be able to do this. So the reason why is that if we have a, a form of value, equity in my company, a token in my company, a debt uh, a relationship between me and you, or a loan, or any form of value exchange, um, that needs to be denominated in something. And it has to be denominated in something that will be an acceptable form of money. And so we believe that uh, any smart contract that has, uh, that involves sort of fiat value would benefit enormously from these fiat-backed stablecoins. So this is a, a big piece to, um, to the ecosystem that needs to be solved and, and something that we're working on at Circle as well. Um, why tokenize everything? Like, what are the benefits? Um, why am I so passionate about this? Uh, I mean, it, some of this is, is, is really obvious. Society deserves secure, incorruptible data and record-keeping systems. That's a, 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 a major benefit to the world if we can have these incorruptible um, and very, very secure record-keeping systems. Um, once we have this kind of tokenization of value, um, it can usher in enormous amounts of automation uh, in areas of civil and economic activity that have been, for millennia, prone to an enormous amount of error and corruption. And so if we want to eliminate that error and uh, improve the efficiency, but also eradicate corruption, um, having, uh, having this, I think, helps. And it brings significantly greater levels of transparency and accountability along with it. Um, the, the bigger thing is that it opens up these really exciting new avenues of value sharing globally between people and each other, between people and businesses and society as a whole. The example I gave of a landowner in one part of the world securitizing their property, expressing that in a way which can be accessed directly by consumers from any part of the planet instantly with an economic relationship that doesn't have a classic intermediary that's involved and does that incredibly cheaply and in an open, transparent, and accountable way. That's really, really powerful and beneficial. And so from my perspective, why is this exciting? It ultimately leads to greater levels of global integration uh, it ultimately can lead to reducing poverty, reducing risks of war, and improving the planet. So it's a big priority and very exciting. Thank you.